Are you really, really ready to have some fun, everybody? Then please welcome to the stage, ladies and gents, Jamie Oliver! Hello, everyone! Look at that! Beautiful! God, I only thought there'd be about 20 people. How are you? Oh, thank you for coming to Festival, bringing your kids. The, boy, the men all right? Nice. Have you been enjoying the food and the bevoirs? Nice. What an agreeable night. I thought it was wonderful seeing Fat Boy Slim raving it up last night with kids on their dad's shoulders, babies asleep on their dad's shoulders. It's a really fine line between total joy and child abuse. Um, but there you go. And um, We're going to cook some food. Um, thank you for coming. Um, we're going to do our best. We've got the screens at the side. We'll be getting close-ups. We've got the kids here. We'll hopefully get some of you up on stage eating a free lunch. Nice. Anyone hungry? <laughs> Why is it? People just love free food. Um, so look, um, uh, the recipes we're doing are from our new book, Comfort Food. Uh, it came out yesterday, the day before yesterday. Uh, this is a book that I've wanted, look, just to explain, um, I've been doing, I'm, I'm the oldest cook on TV now, can you believe it? 15 years. Um, and um, it's, you, you would think I can, you would think I get my own way all the time. It's really not the case. It's really hard. Um, and uh, I've done lots of different stuff. 15 minute meals, that's because the public were sort of telling me on social media, we want quick, quick meals that are healthy. Um, you know, Save With Jamie was about, you know, we were in the recession, but you know, for half the price of a Big Mac meal, we can cook incredible things if you're clever. Um, but this book is, you know, not because anyone's told me to do it, it's because I've just wanted to write it. Comfort food's amazing. Every one of you, have, you've got a comfort food You've got a comfort food book in your heads. All those memories of being a kid, you know, nan, granddad, the first time you tried this, it could be pavlovas or spaghetti bolognese or lasagna. And I've written a book pretty much 60% with stuff from my life that's really important, but not just stuff. And you might have seen me write recipes similar before, uh, you know, like a lasagna or a fish pie. But this book is about intensely getting all the perfect bits, going a bit crazy and telling you guys how I get an amazing home run of a meal at home. Um, but then I went on to social media, went on to Instagram, we put it out to the rest of the world. We had about 16,000 replies coming back in and we had all of the favorite comfort food dishes from all these countries all around the world. It was amazing. So we're gonna kick off today with something from another country um, and uh, something that I remember when I was about, oh God, I was about, uh, seven years old, and um, uh, like I said, kids, I am getting old now. I'm 40 next year, and um, I remember being seven, going to our local Chinese restaurant, which actually was quite a good one, and um, I tasted Chinese ribs for the first time. Sticky ribs, melt-in-your-mouth meat, the flavour, that kind of barbecue sauce. I had sauce all around my face, all around my fingers. It was just brilliant. I'm going to kick off um, with the Chinese ribs. Um, now, before I do that, I've got a guest on stage today. Now, I don't know if you guys have been down to the farm here, um, but it's really what, what we try and do at Festival is really get a connection between growing and, and the farm and food uh, and some of the best chefs in the world uh, all come in here, and it's, it's amazing. So uh, I, wanna, I want you guys to give a massive warm welcome uh, to the one and only Alan Henson. <laughs> hello, mate. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, good. Hello, hello, hello. So you've been kicking off the farm and you, you've been mobbed, haven't you? Well, it's been great. Next door, if you haven't been there, we've got the Cotswold Farm Park, we've got baby chicks and rabbits and piglets and loads of animals in there. So come along, bring the kids and come and have a look. Yeah, it's great. It's, uh, it's really nice to kind of have that connection though, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's every year it's, your area's got bigger and bigger. It really um, has. I mean, that, our grandparents know about cooking food and preserving food and where it comes from. And, and sort of our generation, Jamie, really sort of lost the plot a little bit. And you've helped bring it back with all the other chefs on the TV. But that whole connection between food and farming... Oh, you can't hear you. Can, can oh, we hello. turn Alan up, please? PA people. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Oh, well, there he yeah, is. That, th can you hear him now? Oh, sorry about that. I'll start again. I'll start again. So our grandparents... Did, did, you, did you hear nothing he said? All oh, right, well, he was just saying, he was talking about how depressing it was about his criminal record. Um, <laughs> he, he just got out of Borstal, but actually they had a lovely home farm in Borstal, and that's what inspired him to get into farming. And uh, while he was in there, he saw a few characters. And how was that? It was really lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah had a yeah. lovely time. But, I've, you know, I'm, I'm coming good now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're all good at the back? 
Yeah, lovely, Bless you. Lovely. Next year, I will get a bigger PA and more TVs, I yeah. promise. <laughs> OK. Sorry. So, yeah, so food and farming, the connection. You know, our grandparents have a really good connection with food, understood where it came from, its values, preserving food. Let me just and move this. Madonna, Madonna, sorry. Oh, now, we now, we, now we're getting popping. Oh, that's, there that's, we go. Oh, look, that's that's terrible, isn't it? Quality control. It's this world in the media. And now there's a sort of resurgence to learn that again because my generation tended to sort of forget about it. We forgot about the value of food. And people are getting much more connected, thanks but to people like yourself. An, but what an amazing... I remember when I came out of uh, school at 16, and I went into the catering industry and it, and it felt dark and miserable and it was about rich people getting great food and there was nothing in the middle, nothing at the bottom and it was just miserable. And in the last 15 years, how exciting has it been with chefs and ingredients and farmers and, and yeah. cheese makers and all this stuff? It's so we've got some amazing farmers out there producing some wonderful, great quality grub. And um, yeah, if you can search it out, and um, you can find some amazing things, yeah. So now, um, your lovely PA just reminded me uh, as we came on that you're a rubbish cook. Okay? <laughs> but I, I don't know if I believe that. But you, I mean, we see you on Spring Watch and a whole bunch of stuff on the BBC, um, sort of talking the great British public through what on earth happens in the country. Uh, and obviously for any of you guys that live in the country, that's to a penny. But for the city dwellers, you know, it's a lot of interesting stuff going on. I mean, we're cooking pork today. This is your pork. Tell us a little bit about, you know, th this, uh, this product here. Yeah, well, this is from the Gloucestershire Old Spot. So Gloucestershire, um, county breed, uh, famous pig for grazing the apple orchards of the Avon Vale. And after the war, we were a starving nation and we increased the production of food on farms because we never wanted to have food rations ever again. And we left behind some of our old fashioned breeds of farm animals. And one of them was the Gloucester Old Spot. She doesn't like being indoors. She produces a bit too much fat. She doesn't have enough piglets. And so she became rare. But now, because of taste and animals being reared outdoors and people thinking about food provenance and old fashioned breeds, it's coming back. And so this is a lovely bit of Gloucestershire Old Spot. And I, it's one of my favorite uh, porks to eat. There's the Tamworth, the Saddleback. Um, you, your mate Jimmy has those, mm. uh, has those beautiful the pigs Essex down pigs. there, the Essex. The Essex pigs, I think there was 70 left in the country. And he, uh, and he, got, he got five or six from, from some place. And he, he had the only gay boar <laughs> in the world. <laughs> and he put, he put all these girls in there and this, this boy and he'd sniff about and then just sort of go off and do something with a bale of hay and, and <laughs> nothing would ever happen. And I'm like, Jimmy, no wonder they're a rare breed. They're, they're not interested in women, for God's sake. Um, but um, I, think, I think since he's got them now, they've got smaller. <laughs> like, yeah, thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> We've got 40 left now. So we forget them. Go for Gloucestershire old spots. <laughs> they know what it's all about. But um, I mean, I think it's an interesting thing. The, the, I think we're, there's, a, there's an, a readjustment now happening with, with supermarkets uh, and and, and you know, um, there's an interest. There's interesting things happening in the wider industry. But certainly, 40 years ago, and for the 20 years after, um, the food industry liked to take any animal that could be treated badly and uh, mass produce and intensively produce it uh, to produce protein. Uh, but this is food, not yeah. protein. Yeah. And healthy meat. We need to all eat less meat, but we want to have really wonderful meat uh, that's going to, you know make you feel good. So we've got a lovely uh, rare breed here. We've got nice fat. I'm going to take this. We're in China. So we, I want to give you a recipe that's really achievable and delicious. If you could season with salt and pepper yeah, quite yeah. generously this, okay. this belly cut through the ribs uh, here. You can get this from all your uh, butchers very easily. Um, a little bit more, Alan. Uh, a bit uh, more? Uh, Adam. Oh. Um, I'm going to hit it up with some five spice. I see you chefs throwing the seasoning up. Yes. Is that how you do it? Let's yeah, well, right. it's more to distribute it evenly. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for noticing. <laughs> um, and, um, I've been watching closely. Look, and if you it. can do a nice heap tablespoon of that. Okay. Um, so that's the initial thing that's happening. So we want flavour oh. and tenderness happening here. Beautiful pork, okay? So lovely sprinkling. Um, it's nice to see a farmer <laughs> have such a... Rub it in. Uh, I'll do that. And you okay. can keep your hands clean down. <laughs> he knows where my hands have been. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I don't, but would you like to tell everyone? <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to do the same. Just give me a bit more seasoning there, darling. Okay. Um, I'm using foil here. Um, a lot of the great barbecuers um, will use this method to wrap their ribs. They have many different stages. I mean, when you get into barbecue competitions in America, which I've done and been in, um, thank you, my darling, um, they have many, many stages, many stages um, to ribs. 
Um, but my job for you is to give you the best quality product that delivers, uh, that has little room for screwing it up and gives you, you know, tenderness and the glaze and that eating quality. And I've got a little trick that is a bit eccentric, but it's easy and it works. And, and if you're into food, I know you will do it, especially the boys out there, because we like a little bit of fire. Um, okay, you're going to wonder what it is, but bear with me. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to grab this foil here. Um, um, we're going to make a little foil bag, um, roll up the edges. So if this is kind of almost steaming the pork. This will now go in the oven um, uh, for about three hours or until tender um, at 160. So it's quite a low temperature. Um, but what we're doing there is we're guaranteeing flavor. Um, let me just wash my hands. Um, guaranteeing flavor and, um, and tenderness. Very, very important. We don't want a tough rib. Um, so I'll get that out. And then you normally get a natural little juice as well. Uh, that comes from it. So hopefully that other oven is at 200. That's a slightly higher temperature, I think so. The girls will check that. Um, so here's our little ribs. Wow, uh, you can see lovely. it's shrunk back there, guys. Um, you can. I've used five spice purely because it's a blended spice. Um, you, can, you can get um, seven spice. <laughs> um, and um, did you see that one with um, uh, uh, the comedian yeah, Michael yeah, McIntyre? Yeah. Did you ever see that one? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> nice to be there. <laughs> I love it. I love him. He's great. Um, so look, you can see it's shrunk. And just like I said, you've got like a natural juice here. Let's just take that out, actually. Um, and it's all good. Um, I quite like the way it just shrinks. If you cook it even lower temperature uh, for longer, uh, you won't get the shrink back. And, and, and it, you know, it, it will stay almost like it was. But I quite like the shrink back. Okay. So um, the lower the temperature, the less you're going to lose. Try and think of the best way to do this. Just flop it out. So, look at that, and the juice oh, that comes out—that's all natural. Okay, so that's a nice little start to our story, um, and, and we'll use that juice because we're going to make a sort of barbecue sauce now. Now you can tell if if I look at this, it's tender. I, if I wanted to pull it out, let's just do one. That rib will come out, and that's already tender. Oh, okay, beautiful. but that's that. just one part. So you can do that the day before. You can chill that, or you can just let it hang out for a little bit and we'll forget oh, about it for a little while. It's heaven, Jamie. It's really, really good. Well, that's, that's not even... So that, that's just you know, the meat and that basic flavouring. Now we're going to do the glaze. Okay, so over here, I've got one onion slowly fried off. Um, I thought I'd save you the boredom of seeing me chop onions and fry them off for 15 minutes. So I thought I'd do it the for you. The flavour is obviously partly because of the wonderful way it was reared on my farm. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and in fairness, the, um, you know, certainly... Um, when you have wonderful quality meat, you don't have to highly flavour it like this. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is for sure. But I think, you know, this comfort food dish is just sumptuous, you know. And, and I think comfort food is about food that makes you feel good and you can yeah. share with people and just get stuck in. So what we now want to do is create, um, we want to create a, a glaze, okay. And every, most countries in the world have a glaze. Uh, and just over here, just so you get your head around it, I'm going to use a liquidizer just because I've, put the onions in. We're going to get sweetness from the onion, okay? You, this is, you don't have to always use onion. In actual fact, probably more than often you wouldn't have um, onion. I'm going to take, I've got five spice in here. I forgot to mention that. Five spice. No, no, not five spice. Um, star anise. Sorry. I did have a few drinks yesterday and maybe my brain isn't fully operational, but we are at a festival, so don't take my example, kids. Um, um, or your fathers. Um, I know he let himself down last night. <laughs> I, I, I did see a few parents just fall down yesterday <laughs> for no reason whatsoever. There was nothing on the floor. There was no <laughs> wind. And, and what was hilarious, I saw two dads uh, fall down into the shock of their children. And, um, and he looked really surprised that he'd fallen down. <laughs> He's like, what, what happened? Um, <laughs> I know what happened. You were hanging out of the doom bar way too long. Um, <laughs> so we got the onion in there. Um, ketchup, really, really, really important. Um, two or three tablespoons goes in. Uh, the ketchup, obviously, h history goes back to China. I think they call it ketchup. Um, um, and, and, and the originals were more based around sort of mushrooms, fermented mushrooms. And you can get many expressions of ketchup these days. Obviously, Heinz is the one that we know. Uh, Chinese vinegar. Um, uh, but actually, any white wine vinegar is fine. A couple of tablespoons goes in. Um, we're going to use hoisin sauce. Um, 
uh, free, and that's basically, this is kind of a barbecue sauce in itself anyway. Um, so three tablespoons of that. And then there's this really cute guy um, here <laughs> um, called Alan. Look at him. He's just looking at you. <laughs> Vulnerably. <laughs> Shot with a rape field in the background in Borstal. <laughs> um, you've got your beautiful honey. So I'm going to yeah. put three tablespoons of honey, really important again, because uh, that's going to be complemented with apple juice. Now, tell us about honey, because I know it's the simplest, most beautiful thing in the world. It really is wonderful. I mean, it's... Bees have got to be the farmer's best friend. We need them to, uh, to, to help pollinate all of our crops. Oilseed rape, those beautiful yellow flowers you see across the countryside. Oh, no, that's not working, is Can it? Can we have another liquidizer, kids? Rely on, rely, on, rely on bees. And, of course, apple pollen as well um, to produce these amazing apples. So bees are, are having a bit of a tough time in the country at the moment. There's diseases they've picked up. There's varroa mite. And there's uh, there's uh, chemicals that they're troubled by. And farmers uh, are working very, very hard now to try and look after them, protect them. And on the farm at home, uh, like many other farmers, we have conservation strips around the edges, edges of our fields where we've planted pollen and nectar mixes to encourage the bees and feed the bees and then we have bee farmers come onto the farms who have got 20, 30, 40 hives of bees that help pollinate the crops. And these guys will take bees all around the country to where there's apple blossom or oilseed drape or into the heather fields and, uh, and help produce amazing honey. And this, it's beautiful stuff. Um, and just, just, I don't want to get into sort of political stuff here, but if any of you, re I don't know if you read the interview I did in the Times just recently or follow any of my stuff, and you might have heard something that most people don't know about, which is the, the US trade agreement with Europe. Okay, you're going to hear more about it, by the way. Um, and and, and um, I feel my job is to know, although I've struggled to get clarity on this su subject, um, you know, if, <laughs> look, uh, what um, has happened in America in farming has kind of, they, they, there's many wonderful things been found, but there's been an intensification that we haven't gone down the road of. Uh, a use of pesticides, this, that, and the other, and absolutely things have been pushed too far, uh, and it's, the, the structure is much more complex than here. But without cutting a long story short, um, this trade agreement with Britain is about having their wares Un, you know, at the moment, anyone selling into Europe sells stuff to our standards. And actually, Europe is actually the best in the world. There's loads to be done, but it's the best in the world by a long, long way. And we don't want anything coming. And if we did have anything, that's meat with hormones, GMO products. Um, uh, there's about 300 banned pesticides that are used over there, not here. And when you start talking about bee production, uh, it's, we all know deep down it's not common sense. Essentially, most sprays are forms of poison um, and you just want to kill certain things but actually there's a fine line between something that's annoying and a beautiful bee <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. and um, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that uh, but yeah, it's, well, it's important that w these standards we've got we've fought for for 30 years haven't absolutely we? yeah I mean we, we've we've you know gone through troubled times over the years but we've now got you know, very, very tight legislation on farms. Um, in Britain, our legislation is the tightest in the world, and we've got the most amazing farmers in the world. And although we have licenses to use these pesticides, um, they are very, very tightly licensed and tried and tried and tried over again. And um, we hope and, and pray that we're doing the right thing very, very carefully. Well, I'll and tell you what, we're not going to have it, because here, here lies the problem is when I'm talking to government about this particular problem, A, no one knows enough about it, A, there's no one in government that is good enough to deal with it, uh, and B, what it is, is the people that we do know say, no, no, it's all covered, it's all covered, mm. they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, I don't trust them or believe them, uh, but the way it works is that um, America sue countries that don't allow them to have free trade, and they've done it many, many times before, right. and their money and, and their lawyers are way better than any people that we have representing Europe at the moment. So you know who's going to win currently. So that's my worry. Uh, and you'll hear that being spoken about more and more, I think. But um, and one thing you can do if you want to make sure you're buying British is look for the red tractor. So uh, next to the Cotswold Farm Park stands is the red tractor stand um, when it's been then produced, raised, reared and packaged in Britain. And um, you can look for the red tractor. It's only the very basic minimum agricultural standards. It isn't anything over and above what we our legislation in Britain. But it's a great thing to look for as a base standard just to be safe and secure that it is good quality British food. OK, lovely boy. So enough of the political, political stuff, <laughs> but, um, but we only mention it because at some point we're going to need your help, um, maybe a year or so. But 
we got this lovely meat. We've blended up this barbecue sauce. Um, the juice from here as well. We don't want to waste any of that. That can go in. Um, and like I say, a, a glaze can be as simple as ketchup, honey, apple juice. Uh, we've made a, sort of quite a pimped version here. Um, now, we're just going to brush this on the meat. Um, and we want to kind of go to a situation where maybe I can take a... Is there a wire, wire rack there that I can nick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, what I'll do is... Um, oh, it's so tender, it's unbelievable. Um, I'm just going to pour this barbecue sauce over. Uh, and we're going to just let that... You can put it through a sieve and make it super shiny if you want. Um, I'm not going to do that today. And I'm going to smear this over here. And what we're going to do is put this in the oven just to glaze, okay? Now, the interesting thing here is... Uh, this is not in my recipe, and I wish I'd done it in time. But I just tested it the other day, and it was blooming brilliant. So you can buy online or possibly in supermarkets or definitely garden centres. You can buy wood chips. I don't know if you've seen them around. Okay, Have a little look at that. You can buy them just in a bag. Yes. Um, and um, what we do is... Um, let's just turn... We put out meat. Let's try and get it. Oh, sorry. I always find this demonstrating quite awkward. It's like cooking in someone else's kitchen. All the racks are at different heights. Um, so... At this point, I've just turned the temperature of the oven up, okay? And we pop that into the oven, like that. And that'll just glaze. And you can give it another um, little bit of this sauce to give it a double glaze. And that's going to give it like a darkness. It's going to give it a stickiness. And you know that you've already got flavour and tenderness already guaranteed. Beautiful. Now, this was an extra trick, right? It doesn't create that much smoke in your house, but you, by all means, don't do it. <laughs> I love it, and I do do it. So... If you think about it, we've only cooked in stainless steel ovens with a metal coil for 70 years, okay? Um, and, it was, you know, 100 years ago, it was wood or charcoal that fueled our cooking. Um, and there's like a missing element to our cooking that you can't fake, and that's smoke. Um, and this is beautiful apple oak here. And it's, you can take a little handful, you put it on a gas hob for 10 seconds, just to kind of get a little flame going. Right, you can see it happening straight away. It will start to cinder. Right now, if you look at commercial smokers, it's just a metal box with that happening. Right, so that's enough. Okay, you've got the little. Just as soon as a little few red bits go, you're laughing, and then it's in a sieve, and I'm just going to put that straight into the oven. Now, this is going to transform any barbecued dish, any um, chicken thighs. It's brilliant. And it doesn't really smoke the house out, so don't start worrying about that or open the window. Thank, frankly, I like the smell of a roaring fire and all that sort of stuff anyway. And what happens is you can see <coughs> that cindering in there, and that's going to put that smoke around it. So you're getting that extra element. It's brilliant really for home. Idea. So if you're yeah. a lover of ribs or chicken drumsticks, just buy a bag, try it for a laugh, and you just leave it in there for 20 minutes, and it's phenomenal. So Anybody do that already? Anybody do the chuck burning wood in their oven? No. no. This man's a genius. Trust me. Or is he? Trust, <laughs> trust me. Please trust me. Um, and, um, but what's, a, what's amazing is the longer... Because you, you can even turn the oven off and just have the smoke, because that will just carry on just smouldering. Um, but you can kind of take a bit out, try a leg, and then you, you'll start to realise half an hour, good, and you can just keep it warm while your guests are there. It really does Love work. It. it is just a smoker, you know, and a lot of chefs are using them this day. So I want a little pickle to go with this, a little bit of freshness. Um, so I'm just going to... Slice up um, some spring onions. Um, I kind of quite like doing these ribs as a nice platter for people to share. Um, so onions, chilies, radishes, anything, even carrot is nice. Um, what I'll have is a, what helps really nicely is if you've got a little bowl of iced water. So I'm sure one of my girls will Somewhere. bring, bring iced that water. Out. Now, when you put finely sliced veggies in iced water, it just curls up and goes nice. extra crunchy. Nice. Okay. Um, and then when uh, you have that job. with hot, sticky ribs that are a little bit spicy, it's a beautiful thing. There we are, Jamie. Um, bit of ice water. You just pulled that from my crutch. Where the hell yeah, did that I come from? I don't know. I just, you know, froze it down there. Wow. Shall I, shall I put it on the cooker? Is that not going to work? No, no, that's perfect. Oh. Thank you very much. It has, um, has a little bit of a... Wonderful. When I was, you can pull those up if you want, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, I was, um, when I was a kid, one of the jobs we used to do was um, decorate these radishes. It's really a complete waste of time. Um, and I did it for years. And um, um, 
and I originally loved it, and then after 3,000, I hated it. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, we just did that. A, a lot of this comfort thing is about nostalgia. It's a lot about memories. Um, and uh, spring onions go in. If you look down the supermarkets now, um, you can get some lovely different chilies. Um, these different varieties that we're getting now, I mean, it is making the regular, you know, tomatoes, carrots, you know, chilies. I mean, it's, it's funny, that, I mean, even the humble carrot, you know, which is orange, that's because um, the Dutch, um, you know, the Dutch farmers were prolific even hundreds of years ago, um, and their royal family is called the House of Orange, and to, and to sort of warrant one of their family occasions, royal occasions, they made all seeds orange as a celebration. I mean, imagine that happening now, <laughs> you know, um, and, and uh, the carrot was orange ever since, but uh, the carrot isn't orange. It was always a purple variety. Yeah, and they're but bringing them back now, aren't the purple ones? There's some really purple, good guys. Purple, white, pink, yeah. yellow. Yeah. They're fantastic. Um, and I really, you know, they don't cost any more to sow. They don't cost any more to, to, uh, to, to grow. They're not more prone, um, um, certainly from the farmers I've spoken to and, and growing them myself to any other sort of bugs or anything. But, you know, look at these chilies. Look at these wonderful colours. And I they're mean, really, we're growing those at home in the kitchen. You can just buy these little chilli seeds and plant them and they're simple to grow, aren't they? You can grow your own chilies. Well, that's the thing. Well, and that, you know, if you ever find chilies down the market, farmer's market, supermarket, and if you find them that you like, um, once you've found the ones you like, theoretically, you never have to buy chilies ever again because you just take the seeds out, put it in a little um, envelope, you know, put it, you let them dry, you know, and you can sew them up and, um, you know, grow the same chilies and, and just constantly grow from the ones that you love. But, yeah. you know, I think chilies are interesting. Um, we've got that heat. And I think you can see what I'm doing now. I'm removing the seeds um, and that little white bit of membrane. And that's the really hot part. Um, so we're going to lose that because, you know, even in the hottest chili, um, there is flavour and you can get some amazing, sweet, delicious cherry-like flavour. So I'm going to finely slice this chili like this, followed by some radishes. Um, now, um, before I serve up these lovely ribs, um, there's so much going on today. Now, over there, just because I love them dearly, there's the Neil's Yard Dairy Stand, right? And we all love uh, Neil's Yard. They've done incredible things for British farming, supporting and mentoring cheesemakers. And, um, you know, actually, selling a burger at a festival is really easy, but doing a cheese platter actually is quite a new thing. They are serving the most incredible cheese platters with little condiments, and you get a platter to go and check them out because it's incredible and unbelievable, uh, and I think they'd appreciate a, a little bit of love. Um, and that's what we try and do at this festival is, you know, try and maybe, we want to give people what they want, but also let's try and get a few things that are a bit different uh, as well. I mean, the British cheese industry has had an amazing 20 years, isn't it? It has. I mean, fantastic now that a lot of farmers, uh, even on scale, are looking at producing their own products. They're, you know, cutting out the middlemen. So people making ice cream, cheese, yogurts, you name it. And um, the milk industry has had a bit of a tough time of late. Um, but those people who have managed to create their own markets, producing their own cheeses, are, are really doing quite well and producing some wonderful products all over the country. Do you know what, I, I was sticking up for the, um, the milk farmers a, about a year and a half ago. Um, uh, just, you know, just tweets and general bits. And this clever journalist um, did a load of research. And even though we were buying organic milk uh, in Jamie's Italian and my other restaurants, um, he said it's not fair trade. And it's really, so he gave me a bit of a, a battering, which was fine. And, and he was right, or she was right, sorry. Um, but it was really interesting that Britain consumes more fair trade products than any other country in the world, yet our own dairy farmers are treated quite badly. <laughs> um, and um, probably we could all do more to support them for an extra five, ten pence, mm. um, which is what it is. But you know what, it took me a year, and because I'm supposed to set example, it took me a year to find out, A, how it all worked, uh, and, and B, the only fair trade milk, unless you buy it from a tiny farm and it's your local guy, um, the only fair trade milk that's organic in this country is Yo Valley. And uh, so now I buy that, mm. and I, but I have to send it up to Scotland, which again, that's a bit mad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so crazy. it's kind of yeah. like, you know, then I'll get told off for sort of like putting things on lorries. <laughs> but, um, you know, it is, when you get in the food industry, it is quite, it's bit mad really yeah and, when, and you, you can set your standards and you know what your brand is about and what you you know what you believe in and what your ethics are and um it can be sometimes quite difficult to to stick to that and find Mate, the right product i'll tell you what the minute you say that you care it's really hard <laughs> it's so easy to not care but um you know there you go that's life gotta live by your 
The price of milk has taken a bit of a knock at the moment because of the export ban to Russia, because of the problems over there. Right. And so the price of milk has really dived, and it's farmers are producing it and getting paid less than it costs them to produce it at the moment. Yeah, so, well, that's the scary Which is a real, a real problem. So should we serve some ribs up, lovely people? Um, we, have, we have talked a lot, um, but this is, you know, this is what we do at Festival. We take our time and enjoy ourselves. Um, now, since my liquidizer leaked, I have water behind here, so I'll be... <laughs> <laughs> uh, ice skating around. Um, we've got that smoke in there, and that will just leave there for 20 minutes. I have got one that I did earlier. Uh, if, the, if, the co if the cameraman can just pop over, um, you can see that was just the smolder created there. We've got some nice uh, smokiness coming there. Um, please give that a go. Um, even your roast chicken, just, just try it and slag me off if it doesn't work. Get those chips, just get them firing up. Pop it in your, in your oven just for tw the last 20 minutes with your roast chicken and just see what happens. You'll get that kiss of extraness. And I'm sure you all do a wonderful roast chicken, but extraness, yes. Uh, we love that. So let's get this pork served up. And then we're going to find some people to eat it. Who's hungry? Yes. Okay, They're enough. all starving now enough, watching that. Enough cool. talking. Okay. We're going to have a little bit like, just to brush on the side. So these Gloucestershire Old Spots are, are reared on the farm. We've only got a small herd of them. And uh, do you know the Gloucestershire Old Spot? A white pig with those lovely big black spots. So they, were, they say the black spots came from the falling apples that bruised the pigs and left black spots on them. If you believe that, you believe anything. And, um, but they're a really lovely sow, a very gentle pig to work with. And produce, you know, 10 or 11 piglets and, uh, and rear them well. And need more support. They're, they're not as rare as they used to be. They're coming back into their own thanks to some really enthusiastic pig breeders, but they do produce a fantastic quality pork and lovely sausages as well. And it, there's a little bit of fat in there. Um, people are a bit paranoid about fat, but it's the fat that gives it the flavor and the tenderness. And you can see it oozing out of that pork now, and it will be absolutely delicious. I've got a bit of a master at work, obviously, adding some wonderful flavors to it. But you know, if you've got a great product to start with, um, you've got uh, something really special to work with. I think it's an interesting thing, like in the health world, you know, saturated fats has been um, one of public enemy number one for, for a while. Um, the research now coming out that if you have good quality healthy animals, sat fats, you know, some of the longest living communities in the world, you know, have higher consumptions of sat fat um, than others. So quality and, and, you know, and quantity, not so much of really good stuff, really great, yeah, but, absolutely. you know, um, I'm just going to put these uh, ribs on a tray. We'll line them up. Nice and tender. And um, yeah, definitely the new public enemy is sugar. God, that's going to kick off in the next few years. You wait. <laughs> right. Let's put these over. We've got our little pickles that will be sprinkled over the top. Sticky fingers. Let's just get rid of these ice cubes here. Look. These crunchy bits will really make a difference. And um, if you want to, you can always finish it with just a tiny bit of citrus. It's quite nice, um, Alan. Just a little squeeze is lovely. So, guys, who's hungry? <laughs> I want to oh, stand up if you're hungry and you want to have a little taste up. There's only so many of you. Oh my lord! Right, we got to pick some. Let's get some kids. Let's get some boys. Who likes some spicy ribs? Yeah. Well, come on, you've got to show me that you want it. Do you want it? <laughs> well, we'll have you, darling, jumping up and down. We'll have you, sir. We'll have that little boy with the red top over there and his mum. Let's have you with a little face over here. Let's have you. Yes, and, and yeah, come up, darling, up here. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Who else? Who else? Someone from the back. Someone from the back. The little kid with the hat. Yes, let's have you. Come on down. Hello, sir. What's your name? Colin. Colin. Sit down, Colin. Make yourself at home. Come up, Mum. Um, just, just sit there. I'll, 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 I'll supply <laughs> She's you still some dancing. lovely ribs. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, darling. You can sit down. Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> um, so what we got here is we got some lovely, beautiful ribs. Look at that. And I'll take the biggest one to Colin. And uh, if I can have one of my girls bring out some kitchen roll, because definitely, without doubt, you're going to require uh, um, some nice kitchen rolls for this. This is sticky finger stuff. So I'm going to give it to you. Uh, and if you can serve the people on your left and right and have a little eat up, um, you have the best house, uh, best seats in the house there. 
Um, there should be another little kid coming down, is there? Yeah, here I we think are. Making look. their way. Here he is. He's coming through. Don't worry. For your sticky son. fingers. There we go. Okay. Yeah, a more. Next recipe. Yeah, have, a, have a whole loaf. There we go. Beautiful. Um, okay. Next recipe. Delicious. Um, this is um, a schnitzel. Okay. Who, uh, you know what schnitzel is? Oh, it's a beautiful thing. So it's a breaded, uh, breaded pork or veal, um, and um, flour, eggs, breadcrumbs. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you how to do it. It's a really wonderful dish, sort of from those mountainous regions. We're not really quite sure exactly if it's Austria, or Switzerland, or Germany, but they all love it. Um, we're going to do it with a potato salad, uh, and little pickles, uh, and a little jam. And uh, pass it along, mate. Has everyone got one? Oh, yeah, that's it, mine. Shall I run uh, around with it? Even a, bit? a radish. Did you have one, sir? Have you taken one yourself yet? Oh, you've got one here, okay. Yeah, well, I'll, that's I'll it. Go on, mate. Go and find two lucky people over there to, there to have some more. Um, Look at that. Here we go. Here we go, ladies. So, uh, well, yeah, just going to put in. I'm going to take, take a couple. Take a couple there. Here we are, nice big man. Here we are. Hello, darling. Just a couple of those. So, we have this little family here. So, it's not enough to go round. Oh, that's it. You can have a radish. <laughs> oh, that's a fatty bit, lovely. I think it's all got. Beautiful. You're groveling there now, mate. You've got only tray left. There we go. Look at that one. Have that. Oh, yum, so, yum, yum, um, very radish. simple. I mean, this is a way of, 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 of making... I mean, these, these are cuts from the leg, so they're a little tougher, they're leaner. Um, so when you flour, egg and breadcrumb them, you know, you're putting that lovely crunchy topping on it. You're bulking it out. Um, so the French would call this a pané. Um, now, Alan, should we talk about... Um, Veal for a second, because yeah, so we are still in a kind of a, a time where people are saying that it's you know unfair and this that, and the other, and they're in crates. But can you sort of tell people what the history of yeah, veal sure, is and sure. where we are now? So obviously, in the dairy industry, um, for an animal, for a mammal to produce milk, um, she has to give birth. So she gives birth to a calf, but we want to collect the milk from her so we can use it to make ice cream and have on our cornflakes and all the rest of it. And so the calf then is an animal that needs to be reared from a very very young age. And um, if they have no value, they're, they're often, or they used to be, destroyed at, at birth. And now there's a, a resurgence of people eating veal to give that calf a use. And veal is uh, a young animal's reared traditionally on just milk. But that has changed now, and you can buy rosé veal, so they have milk, and they'll have concentrate feeds, and they'll have straw. They'll be reared in barns rather than in small enclosures. And so in Britain now, we've got some fantastic rosé veal being produced across many of our farms. And it's a wonderful, delicious, tender product um, that is uh, that's come from the dairy industry, and very, very important that we that we eat it and support it. In my mind, well, that's the, that's the thing. I, mean, I think it's if you've committed to eating meat, you want it to be quality, you want ethics and welfare to be at the highest, but also you want to utilise everything. And, and, and no farmers like waste, do they? Absolutely. And there are cases across Europe where veal is our animals are reared in very, very small enclosures. They're kept in the dark. They're only fed milk and those sorts of things. And so the ethics behind that kind of rearing isn't very special. But if you can rear them in barns with straw and freedom and, and light to a certain degree, um, well, plenty of light as much as they want, they, then that's much, much better. And so you can just look for British rosé veal and, and choose to eat that if if that's where your uh, where your ethics stand. So um, I've just breaded these two. Um, um, the, the, the method of cooking uh, these uh, is in a pan with a little oil and at the end a little knob of butter. Um, it's very easy to do. Uh, and like I say, you can use um, cheaper cuts um, of meat, the leg, um, and you just trim it out and, and, and you could use a little hammer to tenderize it. I've got the pan on there. Um, I'm not going to cook it just yet because I want to do a classic thing to have this uh, with this um, is uh, a potato salad. And actually, you know, because we're all overwhelmed by horrible potato salads um, pre-made, done for us, um, it's quite nice sometimes to go back uh, and do uh, a really nice one properly. So lovely um, new potatoes here. Um, uh, what, cook them till tender. Uh, and then while they're still hot, we will dress them. Um, so in the spirit of, you know, this dish, uh, we're using sour cream, which is a lovely, lovely thing to dress it in, just lightly. Um, I'm just going to quarter these up, but you can squash them if you want. Sometimes they mush up some and keep some chunky, so you have a contrast of textures. Um, I'm just going to grab a little bowl to toss that in. I don't know if you've got one, girls. Um, it's probably right in front of me, knowing me. Um, <laughs> 
Do you want this one? Thank you. That's oh, you're gone now. Look, it's on it. It was like right in front of me and I moved it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, yeah, I think the way to dress this and make it delicious um, is by complementing it with just a few simple things. Um, a little brave teaspoon uh, of mustard. Don't be too weak. Um, can you grab us a teaspoon from over there, mate? Yeah. Um, I've got some lovely chives. Um, just a little olive oil. And, um, and just season it to taste, and that'll be lovely. You can have it warm or cold. Great impact lunches. But with a lovely, hot, crisp schnitzel, it's going to be amazing. Um, and then the other thing that they often have alongside a little bit like our pork and apple sauce, they'll have some kind of like bramble jam. Um, so we'll have some blueberry jam or blackberry jam, just a little blob on the side. It works really, really well. Thank you, darling. So a heap teaspoon of mustard goes I'm in. a great assistant. Just see the way that I just, you know. I could be a sous chef. Could I? No. You, you, you could be. <laughs> <laughs> what is a sous chef? A second chef. <laughs> second chef. Yeah, I think you'd be more like a commie chef. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to finely slice chives. Again, I mean, herbs. Uh, chives are one of the... I've only plant, I've got like 20 chive plants at my house. Um, I planted them 12 years ago and I've never, ever had to do anything ever again. They come back fantastically for five months of the year and then they die back and you don't see them for six months. But, you know, these her if you look at the price of herbs in supermarkets, it's such a rip-off. And really the only things I buy are things that are a bit more tender, like coriander or... or, or uh, basil, but mint is just the most fantastic weed, as is, you know, sage, thyme. I mean, I just, if there were no herbs, I would give up cooking tomorrow. Um, and chives, again, so, so different. So I'm just going to stir this up. I'll use a spoon here and here. Uh, my sous chef, uh, I've just promoted you. Um, <laughs> my you. sous chef uh, will toss that up with the two spoons. Yeah. Um, and I'll put a little bit of lemon juice in there as well. Uh, just go over there and there have a little toss up, my friend. Okay, there we go. And then we want to just taste and balance and season. When the potatoes are warm, they are much better at sucking in um, Ooh, uh, seasoning. Are you all right, love? <laughs> yeah? yeah? You want to? Okay. All right. That. That's it. <laughs> I don't know why you're clapping her. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it to all of you now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we got the potato salad. Um, little pickles. Um, th you know, this might divide people. This is a really important part um, of, you know, these fried meat dishes. Um, it's like little crunchy bits of popping perfume and stuff like that. So we have, you know, capers, little caper berries like this. We have little gherkins uh, like this, and we just finely chop them, and it's a little sprinkle, and it really, really, really eats incredibly well, uh, and for me, makes it. Uh, you can have as little or as much as you like. Um, so I'm just going to simply chop those up like that. Um, and there's some parsley in there, some anchovy. And again, these are some of, some of these things are quite sort of pungent flavours. Uh, and, oh, I don't like anchovies, I don't like anchovies. But, you know, if anchovies used correctly, you'll never really know it's kind of there. It's more of a, a depth of flavour that works very, very well. So, parsley stalks, parsley, anchovies, shallots, capers, gherkins. It's going to be a lovely little sprinkle happening. Um, now, if you wouldn't mind, that pan should be on a nice heat now. We'll, um, yep. if we can um, add some oil here... And that's Beautiful. A, a highly filtered, just um, cheaper oil. Now, let's just talk about this because I think people get confused. Um, yes, it's true. Ground nut oil, sunflower oils are much better at wok frying and very high temperature cooking, 100%. Um, if you've got a great oil like this, which is sort of 12 quid a bottle, um, you know, you're not going to cook on it. The sort of two, three quid stuff you get in a supermarket is brilliant. It's, it's not of the best quality. Rapeseed, let's do it with your rapeseed. Um, that actually can handle heat um, really, really well. British rapeseed. But, um, Put the wrong one in, whoops. No, no, that's cool. Um, I mean, do you, do you make rapeseed? Yeah, we do, yeah. So we grow oilseed rape, the yellow flowers you see uh, across the countryside that comes into flower sort of late May, early June. 
and, um, and we grow acres and acres of it. It's become a very, very popular crop across Britain as a break crop, so you can grow wheat, barley, and then oilseed rape to, to break the type of crop you're growing, so there's not a spread of disease from one year to the next. And it's used in margarines and cooking oils and those sorts of things. From the flowers, it produces a little um, pod, and inside that is a tiny, weeny little black seeds that are crushed, and you get rapeseed oil. So we, um, all ours goes to our neighbour, a guy called Hamish Campbell, who produces this R oil. And um, he has, it, it's cold pressed, so that it just goes through some crushes, and the little black seeds are squeezed, and the oil runs out. And it makes a wonderful oil that can be used in dressings, but also for frying. And uh, it's becoming very, very popular. So look out for, for rapeseed oil. There's lots of people producing it across Britain, and our local guy, Hamish Campbell, produces this R oil. And it's, it's delicious. In fact, I think it challenges olive oil very well uh, in dressings and those sorts of things. So I'm a big fan. I mean, I think, it's, from my point of view, it's very different to olive oil. It, it's, it's a really it's nice and sweet. It's really nice and neutral. It's brilliant for making mayonnaises, marinades, wok frying, high temperature, low temperature cooking. Um, you know, it's, it is great, and it's cold pressed as well, isn't it? So yeah. you've yeah. still got all those kind of nutrients in it, certainly if you're using it from cold. Uh, I've just thrown some herbs in here just because any woody herbs I'd normally grab. As I'm cooking it, I'm sort of agitating the pan like that, and that's kind of one of the te techniques that they would use. And we'll keep an eye on this. Um, and obviously we're frying in oil with a bit of butter, so we are talking about a treat dish here. Um, but what a treat dish it is too. Always a bit worrying when we're doing these demos because the wind comes in and it's not quite heating the pan up the way I want it. But uh, we should be good. Um, I'm going to look for my platter now so we can serve up this dish. Um, girls, I think I've exhausted all forms of platter. Uh, in the, have we got a nice, yeah, just a nice oval platter that to serve on. Something a bit bigger might be quite nice. Um, so look, we've got our pickle. Um, we've got the lovely uh, veal cooking here like this. There's a few bits of sage in there. Look at that gorgeous golden colour. Um, it's going to cook quite quickly. I think the pan is on full whack. Yes, it is. And the great thing about veal, Jamie, is, is it is so tender. You don't have to cook it for very long, do you? No. It's got a natural tenderness to it. So uh, Absolutely. And like any young animal, um, you know, it hasn't had time to develop sort of big complex muscles. muscle yeah. structure. Yeah. So, oh, we have got a big platter. This is for one lucky person. I think this is going to have to be someone really hungry. Um, <laughs> anyone in particular? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's definitely a, an oversized portion. Um, so we're just going to agitate that. Let's just take this beautiful potato salad. Um, I'm going to put that on here. So a good potato salad. Lovely, hot, crunchy chicken. That little bomb of jam that's going to give it that little sweetness. And you just take a little tiny bit on your knife and just have a little bit as you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm kind of looking um, for that jam. Blackcurrant jam we've got today. Nice, that'll work really, really well. If you um, just come over here, Mr. Cameraman, you can see this is looking good. And I'm really pleased with that, lovely. I always love to have any kind of fried chicken like this with a piece of lemon, uh, really, really nice. Um, veal, so veal, not chicken, Jamie. Well, I don't know what's the matter with me. <laughs> Listen, I've been hardcore for three days, what do you want? Been living it up. Um, yeah, I, I, before I went on with the Cuban brothers yesterday, the Cuban brothers wanted to get me in this onesie, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I just thought I can't do it, because I'm the only person on that stage that's going to get grief from the papers thereafter. <laughs> and um, my daughters all walked in, in what I was wearing, and they went, oh my God, Dad, oh my God, what the hell are you wearing? Oh my God, and they were with all their friends going, oh my God. <laughs> and I went, if you think this bad, look what Alex is wearing. And he's sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and I'm like, thank God your dad's not wearing that. <laughs> um, so look, here's the beautiful schnitzel there. The pickle goes on top. It eats so well, I promise you. Um, and then a little bit of watercress salad, you know, some strips of apple. If you just, a little apple and watercress salad, it is just going to be a joy. Um, and I'm just going to slice this up. I'm using my rubbish little... Um, crinkle cutter. I'm all into the crinkle cutter. These are really awful rubbish knives, but they bring such pleasure. I don't know who makes them, but go on Amazon. They're six quid. And for the kids <laughs> and yourself, um, it's just really, really great fun. So I want to find one lovely person to eat this. Um, who should we get? Who should we get? Who wants a bit of schnitzel? Come on! <laughs> 
Oh, I've got to see the thunder in your eyes. <laughs> Let's, come on, who really wants a nice bit of meaty, crispy yumminess? Oh, come on, who feels like, I've got to feel like there's, there's a man jumping up and down with glasses on at the back. Come on, let's have, yes, come down, sir. <laughs> uh, sorry, I've got to pick someone. He looked desperate, though. <laughs> he looked desperate. So um, we're getting set up for the next recipe, which will be very exciting. Um, this is a very large plate, but um, uh, there you go. There's a, an absolute comfort food dish right there. Really, really nice. Um, and as that man filters through... Um, let's get him a knife and fork and um, get him, sit him down with... Uh, everyone all right down here? You okay? Um, we're going to do a really nice thing next. Um, kids, I think I might be favouring you on the next one, OK? Because we're going to make cookies. Uh, and I believe that these, these are my favourite cookies. Uh, and also, we've got a little pimping going on with the cookies because we're going to sandwich them with some incredible ice cream by one of our farmers that are here. Hello, sir. What's your name? David. David? Where do you come from, David? From France. Bonjour, monsieur. Ça va? Ça va bien? Uh, 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 allez, tutoie. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, vin, vin rouge, vin blanc? Vin rouge? Beer? Can I have a beer for the French man, please? <laughs> I don't think he is French. I think he's... <laughs> he's he, just from he, France. He's, he's from somewhere up north. He's just putting it on. <laughs> he's, um, OK, lovely people. We'll make some cookies. Um, it, comfort food. Um, oh, I forgot. Uh, monsieur, monsieur. Uh, uh, um, just trying to... Jam. What's jam in French? Um, I, I was trying to think. I was trying no, to help no, I, I, no, I knew that. I knew that. Confit de... Black currant. Black currant. What's black currant? <laughs> <laughs> Cassis, <laughs> is it? Ah, yeah, I, knew, I knew that as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, okay, thank you, dear. So, even I need a recipe for myself on the cakes. So, um, you know, it's really important we stick to this. So, um, th there's many good cookie recipes over there. Uh, we tested and tested and tested, and we want to have one that was obviously a great texture, great flavour, but also a flavour that made most people get very, very um, happy. Um, so, um, uh, Monsieur, Monsieur, um, Monsieur, <laughs> Monsieur. No, what do you think? What do you think I am? Stupid. <laughs> Madame. Um, so, um, did you, did you see how quickly you went to grab it? <laughs> yeah, but your dad's proud. Um, my, it's, my, my little buddy loves beer. I give him a little taste, and my mum, my missus gives me a slap. He just <laughs> loves it. But no, when I used to drink beer, I remember when I used to try bitter for the first time, and, and, I, and I tried it. I grew up in a pub, and I tried it, and I went... <laughs> I went, Dad, Dad, what is that? It's really bitter. He went, bitter. <laughs> I'm like... But um, not Buddy. <laughs> Buddy's more, more <laughs> bitty. Um, so um, I think we might have a slightly alcoholic child. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to get some um, butter and um, we've got a little pan. We've melted. Um, let me just check. Girls, have we already melted the chocolate and butter into here? Just the chocolate, bless your heart. Uh, so we have 200 grams of good quality chocolate. You know the drill, 70%. Um, the, the higher percentage in chocolate, the less sugar and other ingredients. So yeah. that's always a sign of quality. Uh, we've got the 200 grams in there. 50 grams of butter goes in. Um, to the chocolate. We're just going to melt that in a pan on a low heat or in a little bowl over some steam water. Um, so we'll do that. Um, I don't use induction hobs very well. I've never seen a chef really happy with induction hobs. Um, oh. Is that me? <laughs> what? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> um, I didn't say they weren't good. I just said I'm no good at it. Um, yeah, maybe they're easy for you, they're not for me. Um, How are you getting on with that uh, schnitzel down there? Enjoying your food? Good, good. Oh, there's, oh, there's 200, okay. Thanks, thanks. There's not, there's not 200 grams of chocolate there. There's only 100. So uh, we'll smash that up. Um, so give that a whack up. 200 grams of chocolate, forgive me. Um, and then... 50 grams of butter. I'm not just being aggressive. Um, so smash that up. Uh, just going to slowly melt that, and then we are going to bring the rest of the flavours together. Here, look at that. Take that out. 
Okay. So then we got a tin of condensed milk. <clears throat> yes. Flavours of our childhood right there. Um, we want some ground almonds, 25 grams. And then we got some Horlicks, two tablespoons. I love a bit of the old Horlicks. Again, memories of childhood. Uh, 200 grams of self-raising flour. So we'll melt this down. And to be honest, now I'm going to stitch myself up because there you go. And when you're cooking, Jamie, and bringing these dishes together, do you just try things out, just try different amounts and then um, work it out from there? Well, it depends what the brief is, really. I mean, certainly on this cookie recipe, I needed to come up with something that worked every time for these lot. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had to pick one flavour, and that's really hard because everyone's got their own opinion. But we just kept, kept testing combinations. So double chocolate was a, a loved one. So you can see... In this cooked one here, we haven't finished it yet, and I'll get to this stage, but you've got chunks of white chocolate with the dark chocolate, yeah, with Maltesers and with Horlicks. You know, it's kind of like... It's, it's, it's happening. Yeah, it's, it's happening. kind of non-negotiable, like, pleasure. <laughs> um, so we'll melt this down. Now, once you've melted this down, we will mix it with the rest of this stuff here. I don't know if I can really, really bother to wait for this to melt. Let me have a little look. Uh, was, that, was that for my drizzling? Ah, oh, that's what I did. Oh, okay, I see. I really stitched myself up there then, didn't I? Okay. Sorry, I took the wrong amount of chocolate. So look, <coughs> use your imagination, guys. Here's the flour. <laughs> here's the Horlicks. Here's the condensed milk. And here's the ground almonds mixed with that, okay? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then once we've done that, once we've done that, we smash up. Some of those, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and then smash up some white chocolate. And then when you mix it together, it looks like that. <laughs> we were going we to be here for half an hour. Um, so, but it really is that simple. <laughs> um, so look, once you've made it, you can freeze up a batch. You can keep them for months. Um, we've got the... Um, uh, we can just do them into little balls like that. We'll cook them 180 for about 10 minutes. Uh, until they're looking lovely. Um, and we have got some cooked already, which is lovely. Now, this is a nice opportunity because we got a local... Uh, well, I don't know how local they are. We've got a farmer here that produces milk and makes incredible ice cream. And this mm. is a story that we see again and again around Britain, isn't it? Absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, where farmers are producing not just a product, but producing food. You've always been the primary producer, but you can add value and get to the, to the final product that we want to consume and sell that from the farm gate or into supermarkets or into farm shops. Then, you know, you're adding value to your product. You're helping with the profitability of your farm and the sustainability of your business. And, so and you're, cu you're cutting out middlemen again. Absolutely. And you're adding the value yourself. So, look, this is the cooked cookie here, guys. Um, very, very nice. And, and if that wasn't indulgent enough, um, we want to do something with our ice cream friend now. So, can we introduce the lovely man from the ice cream company? Um, I don't actually know him, um, but I've only met him for 10 minutes, and he's mic'd up. What's your name, mate? Ryan. Right, say hello to Ryan. Um, if, if a man called Ryan comes into your life holding ice cream, this is a good thing. A good yeah. thing. Um, so tell us about your business, mate, and, and, and what you've done here. Uh, so we stopped supplying milk about last year, uh, and we decided to go into making ice cream. Um, so this is real dairy ice cream, so there's no artificial colours, flavourings, um, and it's just pure dairy cream and milk. Um, we have about 200 cows, so we pretty much milk them in the morning, and then we make the ice cream mix in the afternoon. Next day, we make the actual ice cream. Beautiful. So the idea here is, is that we take a little bit of that ice cream, um, and it, this is really complicated. You put it on the cookie like this, and then you take another cookie, and you go like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, but that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> it's, you're so predictable. Um, uh, so then you give it to someone. But the thing is, I've only got so many, so I'm actually going to make it slightly more awkward. Alan, uh, my sous chef, uh, and you can help me if you like, <laughs> Ryan. Uh, let's just smear this up like this. Um, and uh, come on, boys, don't be shy. Come on. Um, and I will, I will dispatch these ice creams to some lovely people in the audience. Um, so, who's got a little sweet tooth? <laughs> who's got... Oh, my... <laughs> oh, Christ. OK, uh, how many have we got? One, two, three... Right, okay, let's have you two kids there. Let's have you two kids there. Let's have you. Let's have you two. Let's have you, Curly. Let's have you, Hearts. Let's have you with the, the, the lovely thing around your head. Let's, <laughs> all right, and you. I don't want to make anyone cry. Oh. Um, 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 
I'm so going to get myself. Um, kids, kids, let's, um, um, well, they maybe don't come up. Um, maybe um, stand up in here like a little cattle ring. That's exactly where you all should be, actually. Um, that's where all kid, kids should be. That's it, contained in one area. That's it. Love, don't say, ah, oh, kid, kids are not nice. Are you mad? I've got four. It's like, it's like warfare every day. Um, no, you are nice. I'm only joking. Uh, so much so that I'm going to give you a gift of... Oh, you're sandwiching them. Oh, I see. Okay, you actually did do what I said. I was trying to stretch it further. Have we got oh, any yeah. more cookies? Otherwise, we're going to have loads of crying kids. <laughs> um, so, kids... We can split them. Let's um, split them. There you go. So, so right, we, we can adapt to your needs, that's, Jamie. That's, that's, your, that's your sugar intake for the week, kids. Um, there you go. Enjoy that. Um, um, but yeah, nice, I, I mean, at least... We're not going to get any points on nutrition here, guys, but at least it's nice homemade bits. Um, and at least you'll have a smile on your face, which is important. Um, this is an open one here. There you go, gorgeous. Here we go. Oh, there's, there you go. There you go. Just you two left. Oh, look. Hello, mate. You all right? Beautiful. Uh, there we go. Come on. Here you are, Max. Yeah, yeah. Chuck them on. There yeah. you go, boy. Try not to miss your mouth. Um, oh, what, well, you've already had some ribs. You think you're having more? <laughs> there you go. Um, now, try and pass those down. Don't let any adults have them. Yes. <laughs> oh, God, my God. God. Look, I'm going to give you the biggest one. There you go. I'm sorry. That I, sorry. I didn't there miss you go. out. I just didn't. Oh, oh no. For the, no, save me one for the love of God. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me give you a bit of extra ice cream just to say sorry. Um, the, there you go. I am... Oh, my God. Okay. Will you hold that for her? I, okay. Whew. So... So, have you got a stand here, Ryan? If people want to try your ice cream, where do they go? Yeah, we are just next door to Water Sloan's on the end there. Um, so, we've got about 16 flavours to try. Mm. Thank you for coming on board. Thank you very much. Round of mm. applause for Ryan, please. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you. Thank you. And kids, uh, are you enjoying your cookies? Do they get your approval? Yeah. Lovely. Now, when you do feel that rush of sugar go through your body and you start bouncing off the walls, um, just run that way, okay? And don't tell mum and dad where you're going. Let's make it fun for them. Let's, let's make mum and dad have to earn their crust and find you. Okay. Uh, guys, that's it from me and Adam. Um, it's been lovely cooking with you today. Um, Thanks, Jamie. An absolute pleasure. Thank you, as ever. So, uh, now, ladies and gents, um, is George here? George, are you here? If he's not, he's in trouble. He's behind me, ladies and gents. This is George. He is our official show photographer. Oh, um, where would you like us, George? Uh, just in front, if that's the right gentleman. Yes. So they're going to squeeze it. So make some room here, guys. And Adam uh, and Jamie are going to come round on this side for you. Uh, and the plan is, everybody, if you're up for it, what we're going to do is we're going to do a one, two, three. Are you going round as well, Adam? That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll do one, two, three, and what we're going to do, arms in the air, massive shout out. And this is going to make a, a really, really lovely picture. So, all set. What happened there? Uh. <laughs> Jamie, do you want this to give the instructions for the photo? You said what, we're going to do a normal one and then a really mental one. Is that the deal? Normal ones first, everybody. There's nothing normal about that looking up from up here. I'm telling you. Okay, right, so this is the normal one. Medium smile, everybody, and then we're going for best. Get everyone in there. So let's see, you guys jump down, because this will make a good photo. Just get in there around Jamie and Adam. Nicely done. You don't mind being all over the place on posters and things, do you, everybody? No, that's good. This is what we like. Okay, are we going for the mental one? After three, mental as you can, big screens, cheers, arms waving, ready. One, two, three! Oh, that's lovely. How'd they do, George? One more? Yeah, one more. Last one, here we go. Absolutely nuts. One, two, three! Oh, that's a thing of beauty. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Henson and Jamie Oliver!
Thank <laughs> you.